Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amson Peng, and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Government and International Relations at the University of Sydney, but also the member of the Center for International Security Studies. I'm hosting today our first Info Security Global Forum webinar that will be on the topic of foreign interference and information operations in the Asia Pacific. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land the Garego people of the EORA nation uh, for past, present, and emerging leaders. Today, we have four speakers who would be sharing their expertise with us regarding a very important issue that has emerged in the past few years, but also an important issue when it comes to research uh, on the issue of information operations in the Asia Pacific region. So, First, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Frank Smith, who is the Director of the Cyber and Innovation Policy Institute, uh, part of the Strategic and Operational Research Department in the Center for Naval Warfare Studies at the U.S. Naval War College. I would like to welcome Frank back in particular because he used to be a member, a very important active member of the CIS here in Sydney. So thank you, Frank, for tuning in at such a very late evening time for you. Then we have um, Dr. Gulisar Hasiyakupoglu, who is a research fellow at the Center of Excellence for National Security at the S. Rajana Ratnam School of International Studies at Nanyang Technological University based in Singapore. Welcome, Gulisar. And then we have Mark Manantan, who's a senior fellow at the Pacific Forum. And lastly, we have um, Anastasia Capitas, who's the national security editor of The Strategist at ASPE. Thank you everyone for joining us today. So the first question I'd like to open uh, the, work, the, the webinar with is for you to consider what are some of the biggest threats to the Asia Pacific region when it comes to information operations and foreign interferences in your view? We'll start first with you, Frank. Thanks, Aim, and thank you all for your time. Um, I have to start out uh, by giving a disclosure um, that uh, my ideas and comments today are my own and not positions of the U.S. Naval War College, um, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Um, in terms of the biggest threats facing the region, I think of um, a relatively potent combination of large populations um, that are potentially vulnerable to information and influence operations combined with powerful external actors to those populations who are really playing for high stakes. Um, the United States is, of course, one of those actors, um, but I think the U.S. military has a hard time thinking about competition below the threshold of armed conflict. So for better and often for worse, bullets and bombs we get. Um, but short of physical violence, influence and competition in the marketplace of ideas, it's really harder for the U.S. military to understand and, and play a, a more constructive part in. Um, now, thinking about offense, um, cultivated ignorance may be um, okay as democracies. Um, we can be forgiven for not wanting our military and intelligence agencies to be particularly competent at psychological operations. Um, but defense is a different story. And I think failure to understand the influence of potential uh, competitors and adversaries is potentially dangerous, but so is the failure to understand our own susceptibility to these operations and the susceptibility of our friends and allies in the region. Um, I don't think these failures are inevitable, um, but understanding and counteracting our own vulnerabilities in information environments is definitely outside our comfort zone. What about Australia, Anastasia? I think from an Australian perspective, uh, and I don't want to speak from a, you know, a, a government perspective because I think there are a whole bunch of different views here. But um, from my perspective, there are, there are three things that we're really missing in terms of looking at the information picture. One is the rise of influence for hire 
So this is a whole industry, a whole PR industry um, that works throughout the Asia-Pacific region, the Indo-Pacific region, whatever you would like to call it, um, to essentially manipulate publics. Um, and the people that use these services are, you know, anti-democratic actors. Um, and when they, and when they uh, use uh, when part of this ecosystem is actually highly destabilising um, uh, for, for states, for polities. And everywhere we've seen, you know, the use of disinformation, we see a state that uh, has a lot of um, all their security issues, uh, both domestically and potentially externally, um, exacerbated. So I think we really need to focus in on not just government actors, but this entire uh, ecosystem that supports um, disinformation politics, essentially, uh, and propaganda and influence operations. That's one thing. I think the other thing that we don't think enough about um, as states is supporting quality public interest journalism um, everywhere in the region. That is just incredibly critical. Um, of course, we all know that disinformation works by epistemological destabilisation, that is uh, conveying the idea to populations that nothing is true. Russia does this very well. If you look at propaganda channels in Russia, they're kind of saying to their audience, you know and we know that what we're doing is propaganda, but everybody is doing propaganda. There is nothing outside propaganda. And this is an incredibly destructive idea for both, you know, public mental health, but also democracy and, and any kind of functioning of, of, uh, of a society. So I think that's something that we need to think about um, very, very carefully. <clears throat> I think the other thing that we often miss, and, and colleagues of mine at ASPE have done really great work on this, is the use of um, uh, big data by actors like China, who are just hoovering up data all, all over the region, all kinds of data. And one of the reasons they're doing that is to um, uh, essentially be able to, in their own communications and disinformation and propaganda, be able to shape, um, uh, uh, able to manipulate global publics better. And this is a, a self-described aim of China. And they call it different things. They call it things like uh, international social management um, uh, this is the idea from China of, number one, of course, controlling the China story. You know, everything that people say about China, you know, China would, would like to, to shape and control that. But it's also um, about using all of this data to, to flow into machine learning and translation services, remembering that one of the big problems that China has in uh, terms of being really successful in disinformation in other language markets is a difficulty um, of, of speaking outside um, the Mandarin world in, in many cases, um, but using a lot of this data to feed in to actually uh, translation services so that their, their international communications are just a lot more kind of effective. That's just one example of the way that some of these really large state actors are using data, big data and their massive data capabilities to try uh, and essentially uh, have the edge in influencing the global conversation in their direction. So I'll just leave it there for now. Gulisa, what about Asia Pacific? You know, after hearing Anastasia, I feel like we're going to have a lot of overlaps. She provided a great overview of uh, some of the important points. So, I mean, it would be great to build on one of the things that she said, just to be able to expand on this a bit. And that is influence for hire, because that's uh, been receiving a lot more attention lately, and it's being seen as an increasing risk by platforms, scholars, as well as practitioners. So one of the main concerns is that influence for hire is making influence operations more accessible to smaller players, and it's making attribution a lot more difficult. And articles from organizations like SANS, the one that I'm in, as well as ASPI, where um, Anastasia in, as well as scholars from Jonathan Ong, Ross Tapsal, and others, have explored influence operations with examples from the region. For instance, uh, Jonathan Ong looked at um, influence for hire, financially driven, professional influence for hire industry in the Philippines. Um, ASPI report looked at examples from uh, Indonesia as well as content farms catering content to Taiwan. Uh, in my field work in Taiwan, during my interviews, several interviewees cited content farms as a growing concern. Content farms like you know websites uh, catering clickbait, uh, you know murky content. 
And uh, some of the interviewees also mentioned uh, the use of intermediaries to disseminate information, which sort of like disconnect uh, the, the content from the actual source. Uh, and there was one person I interviewed, as well as scholars like Puma Shen, who mentioned Malaysia connected content farms catching content to Taiwan. Um, so that means there is production for domestic consumption, and there's also an international aspect when it comes to influence for hire. Um, so it's a growing concern that will likely occupy us in the near future, but sadly, uh, we still need more targeted solutions to resolve it. So let me leave it at that. Mark? I think just to push the point a little further from the other uh, previous speakers, I think we see this cross pollination of the human aspect and the technological advancements that we see where we use um, troll farms and influence for her and combine that with advanced technologies like deep fakes to sort of project um, this veneer of legitimacy. And we've seen this during the height of the COVID-19 in the case of China, but also in other aspects in the region. And so I think another um, sort of threat uh, where we see um, information warfare and influence operations having a crossover is in the realm of cyber enabled operations. And um, this is very critical, especially in the recent sort of election that happened in the Philippines, where we now see the crossover of international security and national elections at the ballot box. And so I think last year, just to refresh everyone's memory, um, uh, Graphica conducted a research uh, in tandem with Facebook and they call this Operation Naval Gazing where Facebook has taken down um, Chinese link um, accounts that promotes Sara Duterte and Imelda Marcos, who are um, essentially the um, uh, Sara won the vice presidential bid in the recent election in the Philippines, and Amy Marcos is the sister of Bongbong Marcos. And so we see now China flexing its influence operations, whereby it used to be that advanced persistent threat actors are moving the needle in the South China Sea. But now we see this movement from China where it tries to influence elections. Um, that uh, influence elections uh, to candidates that favor its position. And I think what we've seen in the past couple of months with what has happened in the Philippines is really this growing crossover between cyber enabled um, operations and uh, foreign interference, where we have an external power trying to flex their, inf uh, their influence in the, uh, the national security or sovereignty issue or electorate of a country uh, like the Philippines. And I think just one final point, uh, we often point our fingers towards, you know, just a counterintuitive to, to the China, um, China sort of um, issue on uh, influence operations. We also need to think about the growing role of um, tech giants. How do we keep these tech companies um, accountable? And how do states really exert power to control and curb their influence? I know here in the United States, we had a lot of movements on the antitrust um, uh, investigation towards the monopoly of the big tech companies. But with the entry of Elon Musk buying Twitter, what does this mean with a greater technological ecosystem with regard to free speech? And also for us who work in the think tank industry conducting research. So I think I'll stop there and um, open to more comments from the other speakers. Well, I'm really glad you brought up the issue of, you know, foreign interference and what they might look like in the in the Philippines recent election, Mark. Maybe you could talk a bit more about that. And this is the second question I'd like to ask everyone is, what do foreign interference look like in your country or, or region that you've done study on? Uh, we'll start back with you, Mark. So I think, like I've mentioned with, uh, in the Philippines case, this is really this growing sort of cross pollination or, um, you know, ASPI has done a great job of this reporting as well about this um, strategy of cross posting, where there is a coordinated action between what is happening in Twitter and what is happening as well on Facebook and what's happening in YouTube. And I think to push the point further, and I've been watching TikTok, um, role, role uh, increasingly in this space is that in the recent election in the Philippines, TikTok has, has been one of the most influential platforms, has a growing number of following in Southeast Asia, but also has a very much, I'd say and argue, less stringent rules on taking in, in authentic, coordinated and inauthentic behavior vis-a-vis -vis its counterparts, such as Facebook, um, Twitter, and Google. 
And so this growing sort of conversation, not just here in the United States, but also in the region and how much these tech giants like the TikTok, which is obviously um, still debated um, with its ties with the Chinese Communist Party uh, in terms of the bite of ByteDance as the parent company, has really sort of that relationship affects the algorithms that runs in these applications, but more so on how new areas of disinformation and fake news and influence for hire proliferate in this new and emerging ecosystem um, in this region. Gulisar, what about Taiwan or other countries you've been studying on? Yeah, so let me try to provide a few examples based on uh, Malaysia and Taiwan. And uh, I think Taiwan is a great case in the sense that it does also show that it expands beyond the platforms. So platforms definitely are environments that we have to look at, but there are things that actually stretch beyond them as well. Well, let me just uh, start with Malaysia, because um, when I try to explore influence operations related uh, debates in Malaysia before the 14th general elections, what was very palpable was the politicization of the fake news label and its use in political rivalry. And this was arguably overshadowing uh, other perhaps deeper concerns related to influence operations in the country. Uh, and one of the things that came out of that observation uh, was that there's a great need to review political communication practices, not only in Malaysia, but perhaps in other countries as well. As to Taiwan, um, during my interviews, the means of influence shared by interviewees included economic and diplomatic pressure, uh, influence via traditional media, uh, as well as use of social media in various ways to inject influence. Now, each of these dimensions have their own complexities within them. So for instance, I'm currently finalizing a working paper that also came out of that uh, you know, larger field work. And the paper is on the use of traditional media and influence operations in Taiwan. So some of the issues uh, that interviewees see as rendering traditional media vulnerable to uh, influence actually overlap with changes and challenges that arrived with uh, the introduction of internet and the social media to newsrooms. Uh, these include industry pressures such as 24 hour news cycles, financial and human resource crunch, uh, time pressure on fact checking, reliance on social media for breaking information as well as for quick content for the consumption of uh, massive audiences. And these factors not only impact the news quality or take a toll on fact checking, but also the need for resources, lack of funding, uh, raise concerns about embedded advertising or the sources that are uh, you know, funding media. Because against the lack of funds, uh, dependence on uh, embedded advertising as well as like non-ideal sourcing funds would likely increase. So in a way, uh, the bigger picture is formed of many smaller pictures. Yeah. What about Australia? Um, we hear a lot in the news about foreign interference, but what did they really look like, Anastasia? I think the ones that we heard, you know, that the way that it burst on the scene is um, uh, influence uh, on politicians in Australia. So that's how uh, there's a lot of investigative journalism done by people uh, at Sydney Morning Herald and, and ABC and others. Um, and that was really around a couple of mega donors. Um, who uh, have fought court cases and won on defamation. So I have to be very careful um, what I say here. Um, but basically, uh, Ch Chinese uh, Communist Party or United Front linked um, uh, Chinese businessmen um, who donated lots and lots of money, not and, and across parties as well, um, and also who made a practice of of hiring ex politicians, you know, into uh, their own companies, uh, and that. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about uh, foreign interference in that way. So foreign interference through direct foreign ownership of critical assets like ports, um, poles and wires, large tracts of agricultural land. So there's that aspect. So it's basically using the power of one's economy uh, to buy up a whole bunch of, a bunch of critical infrastructure and then using that um, as potential leverage. Um, again, buying, buying off... Uh, key members of political parties in terms of attempts. Now, I will say, and of course, the intelligence agencies have said that none of those attempts have succeeded. 
Um, and certainly in the Australian context, we've seen uh, the China discourse become much more sort of anti-China, uh, much more frightened of China, much more aware than the other way around. Uh, I think it's a brave politician these days who, who says anything sort of pro-CCP or, or really pro-China. Um, so that, that didn't happen. The other thing um, is in terms of Australia's Chinese diaspora. Um, and this is, again, something the intelligence agencies have been looking at for a long time. So the idea of, and, uh, you know, of basically using your um, ethnic diaspora in a highly multicultural con uh, country uh, and influencing them uh, in particular directions. Uh, to the point of you know, buying uh, you know, language media outlets and controlling them, uh, flooding those zones with disinformation of all kinds. And these, uh, to go back to your point, um, uh, is that these are often struggling me media organisations with a lot of money, so they're actually really easy to buy at influence. Uh, but it goes further than that to actual intimidation of, um, uh, of members of the diaspora who might have a, have a contrary position um, or an anti, you know, an anti, uh, say, China position or an anti uh, Russia position. But it's not just China and Russia that are getting into this stuff. Even much smaller countries are beginning to ape, you know, those, um, those kinds of, of, of tactics. So uh, uh, the Rwandan community, for example, in Australia, uh, is also um, having to deal with uh, these kinds of, you know, interferences. Um, in, in their own community life from the Rwandan, elements of the Rwandan government. So, uh, so it's a, it's a, I just wanted to quickly say it's a much bigger picture than China. I think the other thing is that, yes, that we intelligence community has also um, said that they have seen attempts to influence elections uh, through um, disinformation practices, but often through, again, language and media, but also um, things like uh, encrypted media channels, which are just really hard for the Electoral Commission uh, and government to pick up on. So a lot of kind of hidden stuff that we that, that is, is kind of well known that it's there, but it's still really, really hard to do anything about. Um, oh, I will say one thing, and this is not an ASPI view, this is very much my own view, and that is that we, we need to be very, very concerned uh, about uh, uh, countries like China in terms of the disinformation space here in Australia, but we also need to be concerned by other actors. And I think um, one of the things that's come up very recently is the anti-vaxxer movement um, and various other kinds of, you know, conspiracist-based um, political movements that are very online-driven. The genesis of those movements is not in China. You know, it's in the United States. And it's a very difficult thing um, for Australia to talk about because the United States is such a close ally, obviously. Uh, but a lot of those vectors um, uh, yeah, are, are based, in, you know, through uh, what is it, you know, a, a big, very big disinformation culture in the US as well. So I think we need to be cognizant of that. Wonderful segue into Frank. What about foreign differences in the US? What do they look like? Yeah, that's one of those, how much time do we have type questions. <laughs> Um, uh, it, in the interest of, of, of time and, and not an entire separate section, I, I'll disinformation targeting domestic populations in the United States, I think it's fair to say, is an existential threat to the U.S. experiment. Um, now, much of that disinformation is um, domestically sourced, um, so the foreign interference aspects of it um, may be depending on the issue and, and time may be less damaging than the uh, self-harm we do to ourselves. Um, but there is and can be a foreign interference aspect as the uh, Mueller report volume two, um, uh, the 2016 US election uh, indicated. Um, but uh, it is an existential threat. I, uh, the solutions are obviously challenging given um, desirable aspects of um, U.S. political culture, including freedom of speech. Um, but I think it's fair to say that here, perhaps as with other aspects of cybersecurity, there has been a market failure um, and an undersupply of, of the public good of public good of cybersecurity in the context of this aspect of information environments, as well as undersupply of other public goods ranging from uh, education to, as was suggested earlier, um, news media in, in the public interest. Um, so there is um, there are very few silver linings, as far as I can say, on this side of the Pacific. 
So what has your government or the, the US government done to counter foreign interference in particular? And do you think what they have done or are doing is effective, is addressing the issue? Uh, effective, no. Um, uh, there is a steep learning curve. I think we're climbing it, um, but um, uh, it's a competitive interaction. And so whether we're climbing it as fast as, as um, the, the problem, uh, whether the threat actors are domestic or international, um, is, is a separate question and to be determined. Um, shifting the question a little bit in terms of from the standpoint of someone who works um, closely with the defense establishment in the U.S., which is externally focused, again, for better or for worse, the better parts being that the role of the U.S. military in terms of domestic um, law enforcement security actions is uh, mercifully constrained. Um, so when we think in, in the DOD towards issues of how the U.S. approaches information and influence operations overseas, I think we talk a good game about the global competition for influence. Um, but short of war, our game plans, I think, leave a lot to be desired. Um, for example, an outside observer could be forgiven for reading our naval strategy and wondering how American um, influence and com competitive advantage um, are going to somehow automatically flow from our warships, aircraft, and submarines. Um, our ability to integrate the instruments of, of military hard power, if you will, with influence in information environments where most influence is generated um, is wanting. And the disconnect is, is dangerous. It undermines our ability to credibly communicate our military deterrent, um, but also our democratic values. And I think it's um, evident that several adversaries, state and non-state, as, as flagged um, importantly um, earlier, know this and um, exploit America's competitive disadvantage um, with some effect, um, again, below the threshold of armed conflict. What about Australia, within Australia itself, Anastasia? How, how have we tried to counter for interference and whether or not they're working? And before you actually answer this question, I, I forgot to mention that this webinar is uh, sponsored by the Department of Defense <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm sure they many of them can't attend today's talk, but I'm sure they would appreciate uh, a frank discussion on this. Yeah, so from Australia's perspective, um, there's been a bunch of foreign interference legislation, um, uh, and that's been around registering foreign, foreign agents, um, uh, uh, foreign influences, so that we, to try and make sure that there's some sort of under the table um, foreign lobbying uh, that works against Australian interests. It's voluntary, so you can, you, you know, it's not that effective, really, um, but it is... Uh, Basically, a symbol. I think that um, uh, that the government, you know, put forward to say, like, okay, we're taking this seriously. There's a, um, you know, the, the government has really tried to. Um, there's a foreign interference task force, for example, that tries to pull together all the all the security agencies together um, to try and do something about this problem. But I think, as Frank said, so much of this problem happens in another space. So it happens um, in the commercial space. It happens uh, in in civil society. Um, and that's something that uh, governments, including the Australian government, have a really hard time um, in uh, thinking about. It's, it, it, again, you think of the security services, they've traditionally thought about security in a particular way. Um, it's pretty much like, you know, tell me what to point at and, you know, tell me what to shoot at, essentially. Um, very important, of course, uh, skill to have. But in terms of this grey zone area, this area that um, is really playing in the social spaces of the country, that's something that's a, that Department of Defence, um, you know, that is not really their role to reach in and, and try and do something about that. Um, the Australian Electoral Commission itself, a very tiny organisation, very effective um, and um, uh, has a lot of integrity, they've been trying to look at um, disinformation and foreign interference as well, but they have a tiny capacity. You know, so 
uh, they've been trying to partner with um, security organisations, but that's been difficult. You know, it's really been difficult. They have this really tiny capacity. Um, the intelligence agencies obviously um, uh, have added a whole bunch of open source functions um, and, uh, and have really been, you know, very cognizant, very aware of this issue for a while. Very difficult, of course, to comment on exactly where that effort is inside the agencies um, as well. But there's also been a lot of talk about if we're going to get into that, that information game. So let's say take a place like the Pacific where um, we're worried about China's increasing influence. Um, and China has an, an information operations game in the, Pacific, in, in the Pacific Islands. If we're going to do that, what's the nature of that? Do we mirror um, those sorts of tactics? Do we become purveyors of disinformation and, and propaganda? Um, some, uh, not in, not in defence, but elsewhere uh, in the broader academic community have sort of positive, well, maybe we need to do that. Maybe we need to think uh, more ruthlessly about that. Um, Again, my own view is that uh, a, a much uh, a civil society response is better. This is, um, but also that governments need to be, become better about telling their story, and you, that could could be defined as propaganda. Um, but in terms of like saying, you know, who, who we are, what our values are, you know, essentially what our a value proposition to the region is. China's coming in and saying we've got this whole world view. We're not colonialist arguable, um, uh, where the economic weight of the globe is with us, um, join with us and become, you know, prosperous and successful. Uh, that's kind of their pitch to the region. What is our pitch to the region? I'm not sure that we have, you know, a really effective one. Um, so there, there is that sort of government strategic communication side. Then I think um, there's also, you know, as I said before, this sort of public interest journalism side, which is just so important. Um, we ha have... Uh, traditionally, for the last uh, at least 15 years, not supported public interest journalism in, in our region. We've taken away our own uh, ABC broadcasting services. This is a, a soft power tool that, you know, it's just ridiculous that we ever did that. Um, but at the same time, uh, local, local journalism and local um, voices need support in the Pacific as well. They're not going to get that from China. We should be supporting really good local journalism that holds governments to account and promotes democratic values and, and, you know, and the strengths of those as well. So it's a really short way of saying governments can only do so much in terms of legislation, but because so many of these problems escape a legislative response, um, then we need to think much more creatively. And, yes, and a lot of these problems is escape a, you know, a, a, a defence and national security approach as well, um, um, you know, unless you are talking about joining a, a, you know, a sharp power um, a disinformation game oneself. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I think I'll just, I'll just probably leave it there. I want to push you a little bit on uh, this issue, Anastasia, because based on the recent uh, white paper on information operations and foreign interference, it, it, it seems to me that defense has made up its mind that it will have to engage in some kind of influence operations themselves. Am I wrong yeah. about that? No, look, I don't, look, I don't think so. It's again, it's, it's um, all of that, a lot of that stuff is, is not, uh, in terms of the thinking and the background behind that thinking, is very difficult to pass because all of that is, you know, very highly classified conversations, shall we say. Um, but there is a view, yes, as I've said, that that, that is kind of the way to go. Um, and, again, it's a view that I completely disagree with in the broad, except for, um, you know, there might be a specific, if you're already in a, in a, kinetic, a kinetic situation in a war, um, and you need to use every, you know, tool available, um, you know, to, 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 defeat, to defeat the enemy, to confuse the enemy, um, then I think, you know, there's a, there's a case for, you know, classic psyops and, you know, disinformation propaganda. It was used to great effect in World War II to defeat the Nazis, for example, on a number of occasions. So, um, so there, there might be a case there, but as a general um, uh, principle, I think it's really dangerous. I think if you live by the disinformation sword, you die by it. And I think we only need to look at places like Russia. In the beginning of Putin's reign, for example, he had a really sophisticated ideas about manipulating and managing public opinion. Um, those ideas, those sophisticated ideas have died off over time. 
And now that we see a country that is captured by its own disinformation in really critical ways, um, its current trajectory is one that is disastrous, that has, you know, will really make Russia you know, struggle as a country and struggle with its actual sovereignty, I think, you know, for the next three or four decades. Um, and it's, it became, I think, it, you know, when you use disinformation, it starts off as we'll put it over there, those fools over there will fall for that disinformation and be manipulated, but we'll know what's going on. We'll always have that separation. That separation begins to collapse pretty, pretty quickly when you start governing by disinformation or projecting power by disinformation. It's very difficult to begin to separate governing elites from the disinformation that they purvey. Um, and you essentially, you, you, uh, you see governments that self-radicalise in the end. So I think um, that's one of the reasons I think it's really, really dangerous. And the other thing that I think is really dangerous is um, trust is a, you know, is a really, really valuable ge geopolitical commodity right now. And I think that we see that, in, again, sorry to use a, a Russia-Ukraine example, but um, when countries have come together to sanction Russia and do it very quickly, they're able to do that because there's a degree of trust um, in, in each other's systems and each other's motivations and, and a shared worldview and values about human flourishing. I think that when you, you know, start to pump out disinformation um, and, and become part of that game yourself, you start to erode that really, really precious commodity of trust. Um, and I don't think Australia should be getting into that game. Fantastic. So let's shift this towards the Philippines. Uh, I think the Philippines is pretty much where all factors of influence operations live. It's like an ecosystem of influence operations. You've got, you know, the industry, the click farms, you've got governments who have been and have proven to be engaging in disinformation against their own citizens. Uh, they are being also attacked by other types of foreign interference disinformation. So Mark, give us a bit of a picture of what, what, you know, what does the government think when they talk about foreign interference or information operations? What does it mean in the Philippines? So I think in the last um, government, uh, the vice president candidate, um, Kiko Panglinan, filed a legislation to curb um, disinformation, fake news in the country, but that didn't fly. And I think across Southeast Asia, the Philippines is one of the country who has, hasn't really sort of thought through about a legal framework on how to counter um, disinformation and fake news. And, um, you know, it fails in comparison with other countries such as Indonesia, Vietnam, and to some extent, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Malaysia. So um, as Anastasia and also, you know, building on Anastasia and Frank's um, assessment, I think there is this, and also as a Filipino living in the United States across Indo-PACOM, I would argue that governments often think about information operation from a very defense sort of oriented perspective. And I think in countries, developing countries in Southeast Asia, and to some degree Taiwan as well, I think there is a growing sort of cognizance that rather than looking at foreign interference from a defense perspective, there is a growing resilience perspective that is on the horizon. And I give you an example of this. Um, the bad news is, yes, uh, the Philippines has become this role model of disinformation and fake news, but also there are a lot of coalitions of civil society and um, academics bonding together um, to really counter disinformation. And we have, for instance, this coalition called Czech.ph, um, university professors who are really working 24 hours 7 to counter disinformation, particularly at the height of the election. Um, to cross over to um, our neighbor in Taiwan, we have Kofax. Kofax is a very lively um, civil society that often lives in Line. Line is an app, um, a messaging app famous in Th Thailand and also in other parts in Southeast Asia, where it's really a community-driven approach to correct lies and disinformation and fake news. And often I, in my conversation with Audrey Tang, which is the digital minister in Taiwan, you would always say that they're aiming for a nerd immunity. It's not a herd immunity, but a nerd immunity where every individual or every, or, you know, people in the community are aware of fake news. And in the Philippines, that's very much not the, the case because um, 
it's obvious that demo- democracy in Southeast Asia is really backsliding, but more so the level of education and critical awareness. And I think this is where the conversation where Australia and the other allies and partners across the region, um, even the United States comes to the big picture when thinking about overseas development aid. Where do we put our money in terms of supporting communities, building resilience towards fake news? And so I think again, to Anastasia's word, what is the narrative that we also put forward out there to counter this disinformation that will fuel foreign policy and public policies across the region. I love the nerd immunity uh, response, Mark. Gulisar, you've done work in, in Taiwan, which is often the first case we think of when we think of foreign interference in the Asia Pacific. What are your thoughts? Frankly, from Taiwan, I think one of the learning points is uh, definitely from the civic tech community. They're so engaged and the government is cooperating with them. And then even during COVID-19, the way that they try to involve civic tech community in um, combating potential disinformation before it even comes out, like, you know, about the masks, for instance, uh, was really exemplary. And then uh, perhaps it can provide an example for the countries in the region as well. But having said that, of course, like to be able to uh, adapt it to your context, you also have to have, um, you know, the groundwork for it, you know, tech savvy population, uh, and as well as like government willing to cooperate with a civic tech environment and then a vibrant civic tech uh, culture to begin with. But um, perhaps another way that I can contribute to the discussion, because like we've heard of so many specific examples uh, from the region, but uh, there has been a number of reports that have been published in the last couple of years that try to provide a bird eye view of some of the steps that have been taken by the government. So perhaps um, as the last speaker, maybe I can take a step back and try to provide uh, what these reports say on the countermeasures that have been implemented so far. Uh, we at SANS attempted at, uh, you know, listing some future co- considerations as well. So I can also share that with you. So in a, uh, in a report that we published two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, 2020, uh, the, the, the report was actually based on, it was a follow-up to uh, a foreign interference report that we published previously and then building on that we tried to come up with some considerations to take against uh, foreign interference. So in that report we proposed five considerations. Understanding adversaries goals, evaluating and defending entities vulnerabilities, having clear goals for countermeasures, uh, building task forces and responding to specific tactics when necessary. Now these are really high level considerations for future based on current threats. But as I mentioned, uh, in the past few years, there emerged multiple studies that tried to look at countermeasures as a whole, especially with regards to influence operations. We attempted at that as well uh, quite a few years ago, but a lot has changed since then. So if you look at existing global responses, one of the recent uh, works that came out was by Wilmer, who tried to group it under uh, five measures. And those five measures, we see examples from the region as well. One is uh, changes in organizational design, like you know having uh, either task forces or uh, new organizations within government to respond to influence operations related problems. Uh, so, an example could be, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, because it's an example from Australia. Uh, an example could be the task force that Australia uh, has for the elections. Then another one is parliamentary hearings. From the region, uh, Singapore had hearings on deliberate online falsehoods, which I and a few of my colleagues participated in. And if I'm not mistaken, Australia had hearings on foreign interference. Then another one is legislation, which um, also others have touched on. Uh, But perhaps one thing that is important to note is that legislations are not uniform uh, across countries and uh, they target diverse aspects of influence operations. They may be targeting advertising, they may be targeting elections, they may be targeting uh, disinformation specifically. For instance, Singapore passed uh, Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act in 2019. 
Another countermeasure concerns public awareness raising oriented initiatives. Uh, quite a number of them are geared towards media literacy. Uh, but we can also speak of conferences, publications, roundtables uh, that are happening more and more in the region. And then uh, there are, of course, more acute measures like internet controls or shutdowns, uh, which at times expand beyond the internet as well to uh, news media or uh, mobile and TV broadcasting as well. Uh, one known example is from India when they had a shutdown in Jammu and Kashmir. Um, so there are a wide variety of countermeasures that are being tried at the moment. Uh, it's a multi-layered problem. One solution can definitely not fix it. But perhaps one thing that is missing at the moment is uh, a look into how effective these countermeasures are. Well, thanks, Gulisa. That's an excellent summary of existing countermeasures. And you're absolutely right that we're still working through whether they actually work or not. So let's move on to the Q&A. We have our first question from John Tan. Is there a risk that when an agency conducts information ops, it may inadvertently affect the course of domestic politics by favoring one party? If there is a risk, can this risk be minimized? Since this weekend, we have an election in Australia, shall we? Start with uh, Australia's response, Anastasia. Um, oh, it, it's really difficult to speak in, a, in an Australian context because presumably, if uh, you know, if an, um, one of our intelligence services did uh, conduct an information operation, we wouldn't necessarily really know about it or know, you know, be able to identify it. Um, uh, so that's that's difficult. You can only really look at um, you know other countries um, that uh, have uh, done that. I think there's one point here. If you look at um, the the web of disinformation around the world, it's not just each country doing its own thing. They learn from each other. So Russia learns from disinformation networks in the US and vice versa. Um, China's in a, in a constant learning mode, looking at some of these big disinformation actors and and refining their own tactics. Um, and just to kind of repeat a point that I was trying to make before, when you do that, when there's this kind of global self-reinforcing ecosystem of disinformation, um, absolutely it has crossover effects into domestic politics, both in you know, the content, what people find important in domestic politics. Um, so in, in Russia, again, sorry to use the example again, but you know, it's what I'm working on at the moment, um, before the Ukraine um, invasion, uh, pu public polling, and there's so much public polling in Russia, uh, was finding that, you know, economic, economic issues was the key, um, was the key thing for the, most of the general public. Very soon, you know, after a massive propaganda effort um, by the Russian government, of course, you know, glorious victory um, in, in Ukraine was the number one public issue. And not only that public discourse, um, all the sort of kind of technocratic economic concerns just went out of public dis discourse um, and public discourse in Russia is now full of incredibly conspiracist kinds of, of thinking. Um, the way that Russia is throwing around nuclear and WMD threats, for example, is something I've actually never seen before, except, you know, with an exception of uh, perhaps North Korea. So uh, it, it changes the, both the content and the tone um, of, of public debate. So, yes, it's possible. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. I think this goes back to one of the questions that I was hoping to, to ask everybody was, you know, what are some of the good tips uh, that we could learn from other nations with particular example for Australia uh, that we could engage in that also help us or help Australia build its own legitimacy in the region? Mark, did you have something to say? Yeah, I think before I answer that question directly, I wanted to preface my response by saying that it is very imperative that when we talk about information influence operations or foreign interference, especially from the context of capable state actors like China, that it is a wholesale game. And what I say about a wholesale game is it's not just about spreading disinformation online. Take the case of the Solomon Islands and the Pacific Islands vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia. 
China is, of course, supporting these trolls, this influence for her, but also they're backing it up with economic incentives, with, uh, you know, infrastructure, with 5G and Huawei. So if we are just thinking about foreign interference as this very siloed kind of phenomenon, definitely will not be able to deliver a holistic sort of approach. So I think what I could offer in terms of what the Australian Department of Defense could learn from the experiences, at least from the different perspectives of the United States, um, Taiwan, and the rest of the Asia Pacific is I think first and foremost is that revisiting crisis management. And this is very much a, a fact of um, practical considerations in terms of when you have deep fakes, when you have um, this digital forgery that goes around that Biden is going to flash in your YouTube channel that, there, that the US is going to launch its nuclear attack on North Korea. How do we establish crisis communication with our partners and allies, but also with other countries that we disagree with, like China, and also to some extent Russia? I think in this day and age where information really is, you know, swirling, not just in secured platforms, but also um, public um, foreign policies are being announced in Twitter. I think crisis communication is something that Pentagon and the Australian Defense in Canberra should revisit. I think the second item that I also sort of more practical consideration is cybersecurity. We've been conducting in Pacific Forum in collaboration with colleagues of Frank and the U.S. Naval War College. We've been conducting um, cybersecurity tabletop exercises. And these exercises are very practical for us to revisit doctrines and capabilities that allies and partners often um, need to revisit in this changing environment of geopolitical competition. And so I think third, um, third recommendation I'd say is really, let's have the tech giants in these conversations. Because at the end of the day, as we see in the Ukraine-Russia war, tech giants are acting in, on ad hoc policies. Their public policy team in Washington, D.C. and Asia Pacific are running around reconciling um, the demands that, you know, the West is, is um, you know, to curtail the spread of Russian disinformation. They now find themselves in a very difficult position that, yes, indeed, information warfare is happening in their field. But where are they in this conversation? And so I think um, as much as we want um, accountability from them, we also would want to have more transparency from them because at the end of the day, we will just be running around because these tech giants in Silicon Valley hold the keys um, to the kingdom. And so I think for us to really have that constructive and holistic strategy, that's really going to be the meeting of the minds of every individual. So I'll stop there. That's an excellent point, Mark, about looking at foreign interference and information ops as a um, much big a part of a much bigger issue and and therefore we're not you know blindsided when these types of incidents occur any more i think we have time for one more question any more question from the audience if not I would really like to thank the Center for International Security Studies for hosting this event, the Department of Defense of Australia for funding this event. And I'm hoping that this will be one of many conversations we'll have in the region, in the Asia Pacific region, about the importance issues of information operations and foreign interferences, uh, and that we could provide thoughts for how we could advance our knowledge and understanding of these issues uh, further both in academia in research community in policy ground and also to the general public thank you very much for your for your collaboration today and for presenting your talks and thoughts frank mark um gulizar and anastasia appreciate your time and for the sys team for making this event happen thank you and have a good day thanks thank you